Hello everyone. Today we will be discussing about radiation protection. Now uh, I would advise every one of you to just uh, watch the video at least once or uh, if you don't have time you can just speed up the video in YouTube and then just try to skim through the content uh, or the links to the notes are also available in the description. Now the reason is that the people writing the questions for the FRCR exam they tend to follow a specific pattern or kind of focus on specific areas. So if this is the first time you are writing the exam then uh, it is much better to know where you want to put all of your focus in uh, while preparing and that is going to help you very significantly during your preparation. Now there is not a lot of concept in this chapter uh, and this chapter is more about uh, mugging up all the points. Uh, all the points that are discussed in the video are really important and we need to uh, memorize all of them. Uh, for uh, anyone who has already read the chapter, I'll just briefly discuss about the uh, recent updates. Uh, as you know, the ionizing radiation regulation 99 has been updated and uh, these are the significant changes. The HSC has introduced a new graded approach for employers to follow if they want to start a new practice. And depending on the type of uh, radiation uh, type and level of radiation used, the employers will need to inform the HSC via uh, one of three categories, notification, registration or consent. Everything is done through an online portal and each registrable practice will require a separate, separate application. Now, notification is for the lowest risk practices. Uh, it is a no cost method. Uh, it does not have an expiry date and notification is needed for each practice. And if you have multiple sites, you may only need to notify the HSC once to cover the same practice. Now, registration is for uh, medium risk practices. The cost is 25 pounds and renewal is required every five years. Consent is for the highest risk practices and uh, it is otherwise ref uh, referred to as licensing or approval. It requires additional imp information as compared to notification or registration. The cost is, uh, cost is 25 pounds but for this one the renewal is done annually. If a company owns several sites at different geographical locations a consent application is required for each. Few other changes that have been introduced are the uh, dose limit for the eye for workers who are like more than 18 years of age or trainees who are more than 18 years of age is now uh, 20 millisieverts per annum average over 5 years but if it is for a single year the limit is 50 millisieverts. So earlier the value was 150 millisieverts per annum. Uh, the same dose limits but for trainees who are less than 18 years of age is 15 millisieverts per annum. Uh, the way you can memorize is most of the limits for the trainees who are less than 18 it is usually 3 tenth of the uh, normal limit for workers. So 3 tenth of 50 millisieverts would uh, come to 15 and the dose limit for I for general public is also the same and it is 15 millisieverts per annum. Now, a dedicated eye dosimeter should be worn by classified individual. For a non-classified individual, a dosimeter around the collar area will give an indication about eye dosage. Now, according to the new rules, uh, dose records uh, will no longer be retained for 50 years. Uh, they can be stored. They will be stored only for 30 years. And one last important change is medical appeals to the HSC should be done within 28 days of the appointed doctor's decision. These are the major changes to the uh, ionizing radiation regulation. Uh, the only other uh, significant change is uh, the change to the tissue weight weighting factors and uh, that will be described in the uh, appropriate section. So now just uh, coming to the uh, proper topic. The main sources of radiation in medical exposure come by two methods. One is diagnostic imaging and the other one is radiotherapy sources. In diagnostic imaging, as you know, diagnostic X-ray is the main source, and uh, gamma emitting radionuclides are also another source. Now, for uh, radiotherapy sources, there are different sources: beta emitter, electron beam, gamma source. Uh, just know that proton beam and neutron beam can also be a source of uh, radiation in medical exposure. Now, coming to the usual cycle of uh, radiation-induced damage, what happened is what happens is um, when our body gets exposed to radiation the atoms in our body they get ionized and this forms free radicals and these free radicals 
contribute to molecular changes which in turn leads to subcellular damage and this in turn leads to cellular damage and because of the cellular damage usually there are two pathways that happen one is that the cell directly dies and this is the cause of deterministic effects or the other one is that some non reversible cellular transformation occurs into the cell and this is the cause of stochastic effects uh, we will be discussing deterministic effects and stochastic effects later in detail now uh, one point to note is that uh, all these uh, indirectly ionizing radiation are not physical substances with a mass so the thing is that they cannot directly attack cells but the only thing they can do is they can impart some of their energy to the atoms so this is the pathway by which they work they cause ionization of atoms and this causes free radicals now free radicals are substances with a mass so they can uh, they they are able to directly cause damage uh, to the cell now uh, in contrast just imagine directly ionizing radiation which includes electrons and alpha particles so these substances don't have to go by this pathway of ionization and free radical uh, formation what they can do is they can directly uh, go on to cells and cause molecular damage now a few points regarding radiation related damage cells with a higher division rate or mitotic rates are affected more now this is the reason reason why gonads are affected much more or uh, in other words gonads are more radio sensitive to uh, radiation damage now, electrons have a depth of a few millimeters depending upon their initial energy but uh, non ionizing radiation like x rays and gamma rays they do not have a, a maximum depth of penetration but what they do is they just undergo progressive attenuation so electrons have a maximum uh, depth of penetration of a few millimeters whereas x rays and gamma rays do not have a maximum depth of penetration energy transfer is the sum of the energy deposited in the tissue per unit path length uh, just note that it is not the sum of the total energy that is deposited in the tissue it is the sum of the energy deposited in tissue per unit path length for the same initial energy as an electron an alpha particle uh, travels much shorter distance and hence an alpha particle has a higher uh, linear energy transfer now the significance is that uh, damage by higher linear energy transfer particles can cause more damage to tissues relative biological effectiveness uh, is a term which is used to describe the ratio of absorbed doses required to induce the same biological endpoint for two radiation types it is usually expressed uh, compared to x-rays so uh, it is up to 20 or more for alpha part alpha particles so the thing is that alpha particles are uh, 20 times cause 20 times more damage uh, than x-rays or in another words alpha particles can cause the same biological endpoint as x-rays for 5% or less dose unit for absorbed dose is gray one gray is equal to one joule per kilogram uh, the units for equivalent dose as well as effective dose is sievert and one sievert is also equal to one joule per kilogram now the reason that all of these have the same units is because uh, equivalent dose is absorbed dose multiplied by a radiation weighting factor and effective dose is equivalent dose multiplied by a tissue weighting factor and both these uh, radiation weighting factor as well as tissue weighting factor don't have any unit so ultimately all of them will have uh, have a unit of one joule per kilogram uh, just uh, just note that the uh, unit is one joule per kilogram and uh, not gram uh, they might trick you in the exam and give it as like one joule per gram equivalent dose uh, it is a quantity which is only used in radiation protection that is for relatively low levels of dose uh, it is the absorbed dose multiplied by a radiation weighting factor and the factor depends on the radiation type for x-rays gamma rays electrons and beta particles the uh, radiation weighting factor is one for alpha particles the radiation weighting factor is uh, 20 for uh, protons and neutrons it can be 5 10 or 20 uh, depending upon their energies and the uh, si unit uh, is as uh, mentioned previously it is joule per kilogram also uh, sievert 
takes into account the radio sensitivity of the organs and tissues uh, which are irradiated. So if you want to calculate the uh, effective dose, the individual organ equivalent doses are multiplied by their respective tissue weighting factors and the products are added. The sum of all the uh, tissue weighting factors is 1. Uh, just to give an idea of what effective dose is, let's just uh, imagine a completely uh, theoretical situation. Uh, so let's just imagine a person, uh, he has a head and then he has a thorax and then in the lower part, he, he has his abdomen and uh, let's just forget about the limbs for some time. So if you concentrate on the head, in the head region, the, the person has only has a brain which is like uh, a little bit radio sensitive. But if you're coming to the thorax, you can notice that there are more organs which uh, are more prone for uh, carcinoma formation like the lungs are there, thymus is there, heart is there uh, and then when you look at the lower, when, when you look at the abdomen there are like much more, many more organs which are more radio sensitive like you have the liver, you have the bowel lobes, you have lymph nodes and then you have gonads. So the thing is what we are going to assign uh, values to these regions based on their radio sensitivity. So for the head region there is only the brain so just for theoretical sake i am going to give it uh, a tissue weighting factor of 0.1 in the thorax there are some more organs which are more radio sensitive like the uh, lungs uh, thymus and all so for this question uh, i am going to give him a value of 0.3 for the thorax which will be his uh, tissue weighting factor and for the abdomen uh, since there are more number of organs i am going to give him a value of 0.6 as the tissue weighting factor for lower abdomen. So now if you notice, if you add all of these values, then the total would be one. So this patient, if you are putting him in a, a uniform field of about five gray, now if you want to calculate the total effective dose, what you have to do is you have to multiply five uh, with uh, 0 0.1 and then you have to multiply five with 0 0.3 uh, and then you have to multiply 5 with 0 0.6 and then add everything. So in this case you will notice that uh, everything comes to, uh, to the same total which is 5. So if the patient is uh, irradiated in a uniform field then this formula doesn't make any doesn't have much of an impact. Other thing is uh, in reality most of the time like the radiation source is not uniform. Like suppose you have a radiation source which is on the floor. Now this formula makes more sense because this radiation floor this uh, radiation which is on the floor is more close to the gonads which is having a higher uh, tissue weighting factor as compared to the brain which is having a lesser tissue weighting factor. And another uh, application is that it allows us to uh, measure like organ specific risk of uh, carcinogenic uh, potential just based on uh, based on. So this person if you are putting him in a uniform uh, radiation field of about 5 gray, uh, the if you want to calculate the total effective dose, then what you have to do is you have to uh, multiply 5 with 0 0.1 plus 5 with uh, 0 0.3 plus 5 multiplied by 0 0.6. So in this example, if you note that the uh, final total actually comes back down to 5. So uh, if the person is irradiated in a uniform field, then this uh, formula doesn't make a lot of sense. But the thing is, in reality, uh, the patient is rarely uh, exposed to a uniform field. Like suppose if you imagine a radiation source, which is, uh, which is on the floor. So this source is more close to the gonads, which are having a higher radiation, uh, radiation weighting factor as compared to the brain which is farther further away from it also having a lesser uh, radiation uh, tissue weighting factor so in this case this formula makes more sense now the tissue weighting factors have been uh, recently updated by icrp according to the latest guidelines the tissue weighting factor is uh, 0 0.12 for stomach colon lung bone marrow breast as well as 
uh, all of the remainder tissues which are combined uh, combined remainder tissues the uh, tissue weighting factor is 0 0.08 for gonads it is uh, 0 0.04 for urinary urinary bladder esophagus liver and thyroid it is 0 0.01 for bone surface skin brain and salivary glands now the remainder tissues uh, they are usually taken collectively and they consist of 13 organs uh, which are listed here so as i mentioned earlier if you add up all the tissue weighting factors it comes to one so how they have added is uh, the tissue weighting factor was 0.12 for each of the six organ so they have added they have multiplied 0.12 multiplied by 6 plus 0.08 for the gonads plus 0.04 into 4 for uh, organs which include urinary bladder esophagus liver and thyroid and finally 0.01 multiplied by 4 which include these four organs so by calculating the effective dose the risk of car carcinogenesis can be estimated from it and uh, this is mainly applicable for a non-homogeneous ra radiation because uh, in a uniform radiation as we mentioned above uh, the total effective dose will be just the same as the irradiated dose now just a value to uh, remember the risk for fatal cancer is uh, 1 in 20,000 per uh, millisievert of radiation dose that is if you were irradiated with uh, a radiation dose with a uh, radiation with an effective dose of 1 millisievert then there is a 1 in 20,000 chance that the person gets a fatal cancer deterministic effects are characterized as having a threshold dose below which the effect will not occur now the reason that they have a threshold dose is because they have a repair mechanism so if the radiation dose is very less then this repair mechanism is able to cope up with the damage that is caused by the radiation now the only exception is that in the case of eye uh, even though the lens undergoes a deterministic uh, effect uh, to form cataract uh, it does not have a repair mechanism this is the only exception now what happens once the threshold is reached is that the effect will occur so in this case it is not at all probability related like once that threshold is reached that threshold might be different for different people but once that threshold is reached the effect will definitely occur now another characteristic about deterministic effect is that uh, the severity increases with the dosage now if you remember earlier we had discussed that uh, deterministic effect correlates to the death of cells so what happens is the more the radiation the more cells die and because of that the severity increases with the dose now, the value of threshold means it varies slightly from person to person the uh, chance of fetal abnormalities due to irradiation while the fetus is within the mother's abdomen is greater greatest during three to eight weeks of pregnancy uh, as you know because that is the period of embryogenesis now some of the uh, threshold doses are given below uh, just note that the uh, threshold doses are given uh, in the unit of gray so in the exam they might pick you and give some other unit like uh, milli gray or centigray something like that okay uh, so the values are for skin erythema it's around 2 to 5 irreversible skin damage it's 20 to 40 hair loss it's 2 to 5 sterility it's 2 to 3 uh, for cataract in lens of eye is around 5 the lethality uh, of the whole body is 3 to 5 and for fetal abnormality it's about 0.1 to 0.5 as a general rule uh, carcinoma is not a deterministic effect cancer either occurs or it won't occur so it is probability related so stop, stoch uh, stochastic effects uh, in this case the risk increases with the dose the severity of the effect does not increase with the dose so here the irradiated person will either develop cancer or will be unaffected uh, this is the type of effect that can be hereditary uh, there is no threshold for stochastic effects uh, some of the exam examples are all types of malignancies like breast cancer leukemia etc uh, so uh, overall uh, for a uniform whole body irradiation the risk of fatal cancer is 5 percent per sievert or 1 in 20,000 per millisievert for the general population. The uh, risk of hereditary ill health in subsequent children and future generation is uh, thought to be about 1 in 70,000 for an exposure of 1 milligray 
for the gonad now this is the uh, risk average the risk average over the whole population for reproductive population it will be lesser and it will be like more risky and it will be around 1 in 40,000 so uh, it turns out uh, diagnostic radiation is not the only radiation that the general general public is exposed to uh, there are different sources of uh, radiation uh, one is cosmic radiation and uh, at sea level it will be around 320 microsievert per year so uh, if you're considering air travelers they are a little bit uh, above the atmosphere so they don't get that much protection from uh, all the radiation outside like cosmic radiation sources so their uh, radiation exposure will be slightly higher which is around 4 microsievert per hour now terrestrial radiation which is the all the radiation that is uh, rising from the earth itself it contributes to around 350 microsievert per year now radon is an inert gas and it can permeate through the ground uh, radon is the largest source of radiation to which we are exposed and it em emits alpha particles now, there are some internal sources this includes uh, sources like which produce radiation within our body so uh, the most common is uh, because of potassium 40 and the way by which potassium 40 enters our body is often through food now, some food particles might contain uh, some potassium 40 atoms and uh, they can be a cause of internal uh, radiation source and it uh, accounts for about uh, 270 microsievert per year so the total radiation source from natural sources will be around 2.2 millisievert per year total from artificial sources uh, will be 0 0.4 microsievert per year and this includes diagnostic procedures uh, the total just from diagnostic procedures will be around 370 microsievert per year now we are going to discuss the principles of radiation protection uh, we are going to discuss uh, different guidelines and regulations so uh, one thing you have to keep in mind is that just pay extra attention to uh, which points are coming under which regulation so for uh, example under the icrp there are three principles one is justification optimization and dose limits so what they are very likely to do is they they will try to mix up the regulations and then uh try to put in principles from different this different uh, regulations to try to confuse you the first principle of icrp guidelines is justification uh, justification means that ionizing radiation should only be used if the benefits are greater than the risk uh, this point is uh, pretty direct uh, just imagine if uh, you are advising hourly ct for a patient of acute pancreatitis so in that case obviously the benefits are not as worth as the uh, radiation induced damage in that case now one thing to keep in mind is that uh, justification is situation based uh, for example it might be much more easier to justify taking an x-ray in a patient than a ct this is because the risk increases with dose and uh, for investigations with a high dosage then it is a little bit more hard to justify then uh, because the risk factor is increasing so a very similar case happens uh, in children and pregnant women and all because in those cases the risks are much more so it's a little bit harder to justify investigation in this category of people uh, the second one is optimization uh, the principle is also known as alarp which is as low as reasonably achievable optimization depends on several factors the first one is the design of the equipment uh, the equipment must be designed in such a way that it does not give excess uh, dosage to the patient and the second one is uh, selection of technique you know, factors like KV and MAS should be uh, manipulated in such a way that uh, it delivers uh, less dose to the patient while maintaining the quality of the uh, radiological investigation uh, optimization also depends on the operator for example especially in, uh, in, in investigations like fluoroscopy uh, unless an inexperienced person might take longer um, uh, might take a longer time to diagnose something in fluoroscopy than compared to someone who is much more experienced and also a uh, quality assurance program is also part of optimization because uh, maintaining the machines in their ideal state will make sure that uh, there is not 
the machines are not malfunctioning and giving excess dose to the patient the third principle of icrp is uh, dose limit dose limits applies to those who are employed to work with radiation and also members of the public who are liable to be exposed to the radiation as a result of work activity now the main most important thing is that dose limit does not apply to patients and uh, all of the dose limits which uh, we will be seeing in the later sections are based on recommendations of the icrp now uh, this is the most important point that uh, uh, for patients there is no dose limit for patient uh, what is applicable is the alar alarp uh, principle which means that the dosage should be of the patient should be as low as reasonably achievable few points about the hsa the safety at work regulations are issued under the hsa hsa is the health and safety at work act which was published in 1974 uh, the advisory body established by hsa is called health and safety commission hsc uh, another body which is established by the hsa is the health and safety executive now the health and safety executive has the powers of inspection and prosecution just note that the hsc does not have any uh, power of prosecution all those powers are vested within the hse under the hsa three documents were published irr 99 acop and guidance representing good practice in irr 99 uh, regulations governing safety of staff and public is given and uh, it applies to all the workforce the only exception is defense the acop outlines a means of compliance with the irr uh, the thing to note that and note is that it is not strictly legal but alternatives are required so even though the regulations given in acop are not strictly legal but there should be some alternative method which is uh, which is implemented to uh, cover up for that the last one is guidance representing good practice um, it has a lesser status uh, compared to acop and the regulations are uh, not bound by law to be followed the irmer 2000 it also comes under the hsa and uh, this is a regulation that is actually concerned with uh, patient uh, protection uh, but the difference is that the enforcing authority is not hse the enforcing authority for uh, irmer is uh, in fact uh, the care quality commission now a medical and attendance guidance note uh, has been uh, provided by the institute of physics and engineering in medicine uh, i think uh, this guidance note refers to the guidance referring representing good uh, practice i am not exactly sure but uh, it's not given properly in the books the next uh, regulation is uh, irr 99 it is concerned with radiation protection of staff and public and it is not concerned with the radiation protection of uh, patients it is uh, enforced by the hsc the general requirements of uh, irr 99 are uh, notification uh, which means that the first time you are using a, a device that handles uh, radiation uh, the employer has to notify the hsc the uh, employer consults the radiation protection advisor to satisfy the hsc's uh, requirements and uh, usually the radiation protection advisor is a medical physicist the uh, rpa can either be a member of the employee uh, of the organization or an external consultant the prior risk assessment is done by the rpa along with uh, contingency plans so just note uh, that both prior risk assessment and notification uh, come under irr 99 and uh, just some important negative points uh, the first one is irr 99 is not concerned with the radiation protection of patients uh, it is uh, hs it is enforced by the hsc not by the hsc or care quality commission and uh, for the first time use the employer has to notify the hse not hsc or uh, the government or anything else um, and the uh, employer has to consult the radiation protection advisor not the radiation protection supervisor 
and also prior risk assessment is done by the uh, radiation protection advisor it is not done by the radiation protection supervisor or uh, employer and also some things which are not coming under IRR 99 uh, include quality assurance of the procedures and protocols and appointing medical physics experts because uh, these things come under IRMER the duties of the employer according to IRR 99 include that the employer should consult a radiation protection advisor in compliance with the regulations the employer is uh, responsible for designation of the controlled area uh, the employer should notify the appropriate authority if the dose to the patient is much greater than intended uh, because of an equipment fault now uh, this does not include uh, notifying the appropriate authority because of uh, some problem which is not because of equipment fault like for example if uh, the wrong patient was given a uh, if the wrong patient was given uh, radiation exposure now the matters in which uh, radiation protection advisor must be consulted or in other, in other words uh, the duties of the radiation protection uh, advisor include uh, implementation of uh, requirements of uh, controlled and supervised areas a prior examination of plans for installation and the acceptance of uh, into new service of uh, the acceptance into service of new or modified equipments uh, the regular calibration of equipments uh, periodic examination and testing of equipments now uh, coming to dose limits given under IRR 99 uh, the first thing is all the dose limits are given in millisieverts per year just pay a little extra attention to the uh, dosage unit in the exam they might try to trick you, trick you and uh, give uh, three words per year uh, so the effective dose uh, for employees is uh, around 20 millisievert per year for general public it is 1 millisievert per year the equivalent dose for skin hand or feet for employees it is uh, uh, 500 millisievert per year for public it is uh, 50 millisievert per year and for the abdomen of uh, women of uh, reproductive capacity uh, it is 13 for three consecutive months and uh, for fetus uh, it is uh, one millisievert over a term that is nine months now if the age is less that is uh, 16 to 18 years and uh, people who are uh, trainees the uh, dose limit is three tenth of the above that is for employees uh, who are more than 18 it was 20 for uh, any trainee who was uh, uh, less than 18 years old it is it will be 3 by 10th of 20 which will be 6 millisievert per year but fetus is that some of the radiation that the mother is exposed uh, gets absorbed by the uh, body of the mother so uh, in that case how we estimate the fetal doses in case of x-rays the fetal dose will be less than or equal to 50 percent of the abdominal dose on the mother but in the case of high energy gamma rays it will be around 100 percent of the abdominal dose of the mother now here we had mentioned that the effective dose for the fetus is one over term so in the case of x-rays the dose limit to the abdomen of a pregnant em uh, employee with a uh, diagnostic x-ray will be two uh, because almost 50 percent of the radiation will go to the fetus and that limit is given here so for the abdomen of a pregnant employee who is uh, exposed to diagnostic radiation the effective dose will be 2 millisievert over term now uh, comforters and carers uh, refer to a very small group of people like if you have a child and the child has to and if the child has to undergo some radionuclide investigation then you need a parent or a close relative of the child to hold the child or just to be with the child and the for those that category of people uh, we call them comforters or carers uh, for uh, them the employer is required to set a limit which may be up to uh, 5 milligray the employer has to provide uh, guidance on how to take precautions the next section under IRR 99 is uh, designation of areas and uh, control of working practice there are three sets of control 
first one is designation of radiation areas uh, into a controlled area or supervised area and the uh, next one is uh, written procedures now this one will be discussed in the next next section and then last one is uh, identification of uh, day to day practices of what is to be done every day now uh, these are essential criteria under the IRR 99 just note that a radiation protection committee is not mandatory as per IRR 99 now a controlled area uh, is an area where a person work who is working there is likely to get greater than three tenth of any dose limit so as we mentioned earlier uh, the effective dose limit for uh, uh, employ employees is uh, 20 millisievert per year so if a person uh, who is working somewhere and he is likely to get 3 by 10 of 20 that is uh, 6 so if he is likely to get more than uh, 6 millisievert per year then that area should be designated as a controlled area in a controlled area uh, the dose rate could exceed uh, 7.5 micro sievert per hour in controlled areas there is a requirement for following special working procedures the halls require shielding access is given only to patient and staff involved and it should be marked with signs which are describing the nature of the source uh, whether it's x-ray radioactive or something like that and the risk like what is the risk whether it is radiation or contamination like that and for a mobile equipment controlled area is two meters around the x-ray tube and patient uh, a supervised area uh, is an area that is under review uh, and may become a controlled area in the future uh, here the thing is that the dose is likely to exceed public limit of one millisievert per year uh, in the hourly rate it will be the dose rate will be between 2.5 and 7.5 micro sievert per hour according to irr 99 uh, written rules are required for controlled area and uh, for super supervised areas they might be required now what all are included in written rules includes a description of uh, controlled and supervised areas names of the uh, radiation protection advisor and radiation protection supervisor identification of who is permitted to use the x-ray equipment and the who is permitted to remain in the controlled area during the usage of equipment personal dosimetry requirements wearing and storage of personal protective equipment practical instructions like where to stand contingency plans and arrangements for pregnant staff now just some things which uh, do not come under the written rules include setting the dose limit for controlled and uh, supervised areas uh, notifying authority if wrong patient is irradiated name of the employer so the main point is that uh, try to learn all the points so that uh, for the exam if they are trying to add in points which are not there then you will still be able to find it out now these are the duties of a radiation protection supervisor uh, and don't uh, confuse a radiation protection advisor with a radiation protection supervisor uh, the duties of supervisor include a preparation and review of local rules supervision of uh, staff dose monitoring investigation of in instances of excessive dose contamination monitoring testing pp ensuring a quality assurance program is in place ensuring staff follow the local rules ensuring that an effective quality assurance program is in place and uh, risk assessment example for pregnant staff now the overall responsibility of radiation protection uh, does not lie with uh, the rpa or rps it uh, lies with the employer now according to the irr 99 uh, the first critical examination uh, of an equipment must be done in conjunction with an rpa but the responsibility of critical examination lies with the installer uh, now the times when which quality assurance program is done is include first during installation and then at appropriate intervals and then following major repair or mod modification but things like even a software update is taken as modification now the irr 99 requires that the patient dose assessment 
uh, is to be part of the equipment quality assurance program making it important to audit patient dose now coming to classification of staff and dose monitoring a classified person uh, is a person whose dose is likely to exceed uh, three tenth of any dose limit so since the dose limit is 20 uh, it is a person whose uh, dose is likely to exceed 6 millisievert per hour uh, he must be over 18 years old and medically fit to work as a classified worker before employment classified in individual must be seen by an appointed doctor uh, he must be subject to dose monitoring and annual health checks the records must be kept for 30 years uh, beyond the date the person stops working as a classified worker uh, IRR 99 makes it mandatory to monitor only classified staff the monitoring can be done one to three monthly and it is usually done one monthly if the dose is exceeded then they must have an annual health check and record should be kept for 30 years so earlier the recommendation was to keep the records for 50 years but uh, according to the newest update the, uh, it can be kept only for 30 years a uh, dosimeter should be from an approved uh, dosimetry service now if a person works with more than one employer then a passbook is required so that uh, every time he goes and works in a different uh, place uh, they can record the radiation or uh, write an estimate of the uh, radiation he has received from that area so that overall uh, his dose limits with, uh, are within the uh, guideline limits now uh, according to the irr 99 uh, an employer has to notify the hsc if uh, an individual receives a dose greater than the limit a radiation source is spilt lost or even stolen a patient has received increased dose which is much greater than intended and that too because of failure of equipment now uh, how to define whether the increased dose is much greater than intended is uh, by using uh, by referring to this table so what what this table means is that um, first of all it has uh, divided investigation into three tiers like in the top one there is like high high dose investigation in the middle one there is middle dose and in the lower one there are low dose investigations so what this means is that suppose uh, you are doing a fluoroscopy investigation and the patient receives a dose which is 1.5 times of what is intended then uh, the then the radiation in, in incident has to be notified to the hsc also for uh, supposing in the case of a chest x-ray suppose uh, the dose to the patient became 20 times than what is normally given in a chest x-ray then you have to notify the hsc so the way to uh, remember this table is um, things with uh, high dosage which we already know like interventional radiology fluoroscopy and ct these have a multiplying factor of 1.5 and next try to remember the ones with uh, low dose like uh, x-ray of extremities skull dental chest or chest x-rays all these are in the lowest tier and they have a multiplication factor of 20 and then uh, try to remember the uh, nuclear medicine doses like nuclear medicine investigation with an effective dose greater than uh, 5 millisievert will have a multiplication factor of 1.5 if uh, a nuclear medicine examination with an effective dose of uh, less than 0 0.5 will be having a multiplication factor of 20 so anything else which is not in these two tires will be in the middle tire and it will have a multiplication factor of 10 so some things to note uh, which come under in the middle tire include mammography x-ray of ls spine x-ray of abdomen anything anything else which are not in the other two tires uh, you can remember it like that and just note uh, in the case of a chest x-ray uh, we had already discussed uh, it will be multi the multiplication factor will be 20 but uh, just compare that with the case of a ct in which uh, if you have to repeat a ct in a ct examination in a patient then itself it is considered uh, potential for a radiation incident 
Now, uh, what to do if the uh, intended dose is much greater than intended? Is the first thing is that uh, employer has to notify the HSC, and the other things include a record of the investigation must be kept for thirty years, and the equipment to, should not be put back into use until the service engineer checks the equipment. Uh, the main points which are coming under the medical and dental guidance note uh, include uh, the first thing is that it is not uh, strictly legal as was uh, discussed earlier uh, for an x-ray tube the leakage of radiation uh, should be less than or equal to 1 milligray per hour at a distance of 1 meter from the focus the position of the focus and total filtration of the tube must be stated on the tube casing so uh, just pay a little bit attention to this point the only thing uh, which should be stated include the position of the focus and the total filtration of the tube uh, they do not need to mention the working voltage or mas or uh, or the leakage or anything else now the total filtration should be greater than or equal to 2.5 uh, millimeter of aluminium or uh, 1.5 millimeter of aluminium for dental equipment uh, which is using less than 70 kilowatts uh, there should be a warning signal indicator on the control panel uh, for collimation the the beam should be collimated in such a way that the maximum beam size is equal to the maximum image size and uh, some special characteristics for fluoro fluoroscopy include uh, it should the collimation should auto adjust according to the magnification so uh, what that means is uh, suppose uh, you are having a very large field of view uh, in the fluoroscopy and then suppose uh, you are magnifying the image to view a smaller area of the patient then the beam should be collimated so that the uh, outside part which is uh, which is uh, not coming in the screen uh, do not get any radiation and in uh, fluoroscopy the maximum beam size uh, should be equal to the image receptor size uh, for fluoroscopy equipments uh, they should be capable of restricting the field size uh, to as small as 5 into 5 centimeter square uh, uh, there should be positive pressure exposure uh, switches uh, which means that uh, radiation uh, should uh, be activated as only as long as the patient is pressing the button. Uh, the exception is that for CTs this is not needed. Uh, for uh, mobile equipment the exposure should, uh, switches uh, should be able to be taken or uh, greater than or equal to 2 meters from the x-ray tube and x-ray beam. Uh, for uh, mobile equipment there should be key operated switches so that um, so as to prevent unauthorized uh, access of the machine now about uh, shielding guidelines the image intensifier uh, should be backed up with 2 mm of lead for uh, under couch fluoroscopy it requires a lead apron support which is 45 cm wide 40 cm long with uh, 0.5 mm thick lead uh, fluoroscopy rates should not exceed 100 milligree per mi uh, minute and uh, a remedial action should be taken uh, if uh, it is coming more than 50 milligree per minute for the largest field available so what this means is that even if you are focusing on a very small area uh, however small the area the uh, dose rate should not exceed 100 milligree per minute and uh, if you are taking uh, a very large area and even for the largest uh, field size this should not be greater than 50 milligree per minute oh, and uh, just note that for filtration the units are given in thickness of aluminium whereas for shielding uh, uh, the thickness is given in terms of thickness of lead Next, uh, important regulation is the uh, IRMER 2000 it has also been recently updated uh, in 2017 uh, now according to the IRMER uh, the people who have a role in medical exposure include uh, employer referrer practitioner 
and operator. The next uh, important regulation is IRMER 2000. Uh, it has recently, be, recently been updated in 2017. According to the IRMER, the people who have a role in medical exposure include employer, referrer, practitioner and operator. Now, referrer is the patient, is the person who initiates the request. It can be medical and other healthcare professionals. Uh, so, for example, a referrer is the one who is writing uh, the investigation. So, for instance, it can be an intern who is uh, requesting a chest x-ray of the patient. Now, practitioner, this includes uh, radiologists and radiographers, dentists and cardiologists. It also includes uh, RSAC certificate holders for radionuclide study. So typically the practitioner is the uh, radiologist uh, working in the radiology department who is eventually going to report the investigation. Now the last one is the operator. The operator is the person who is actually conducting the investigation. So uh, it includes an x-ray technician who actually performs the investigation on the patient. The operator does not have to be a registered healthcare professional. Now, both practitioner and operator must have adequate uh, radiology training, especially regarding the safety. A practitioner usually gives authorization for the investigation, but in special circumstances, the operator is also allowed to authorize. So, both the practitioner and the operator have the power of authorization. And uh, it is the responsibility of a referrer, practitioner, as well as the operator to inquire about patient's pregnancy status. The uh, IRMER is uh, enforced by the Care Quality Commission. The IRR 99 was uh, enforced by the HSC. The IRMER also includes regu regulation of medical legal exposures critical evaluation of outcome of every exposure and recording the dose, establishment of diagnostic reference levels. All these are coming under IRMER 2000. Now, diagnostic reference levels are the doses uh, for typical examination uh, for standard size patients and they are not dose limits. So, for example, uh, suppose you are having a uh, 70 kilo male with a height of maybe 170 centimeter and then you are doing a chest x-ray then you would expect uh, a dose of about around 0 0.15 uh, millisievert and that would be the diagnostic reference level it is not a limit it is not that uh, if another patient comes who is like much more fatter that we cannot cross this limit it is just what you would expect for a standard size patient and the DRL levels are to be set locally by the employer. The local value should not be given uh, greater than the national uh, DR and DRL values unless it is justified. And there are some special attention areas uh, with regard to diagnostic reference level. This include medical legal cases, health screening, children, lactation and pregnant patients. Uh, DRLs are generally set taking into account the results of those audits and require an investigation to be made if the DRL is consistent, consistently exceeded. According to IRMER, uh, DRL is to be set having regard to the European diagnostic reference levels whenever it is available. Uh, but the problem is European DRLs are not very well established. So uh, IRMER also provides an alternative option to use the national DRLs. Uh, the national DRLs are based on the surveys of radiological practice in UK made by the National Radiological Protection Board. Uh, DRLs are uh, set in, in terms of measurable quantities like uh, screening time, dose seria product, entrance surface and entrance surface dose. Diagnostic reference level for CT scan are generally set in terms of dose length product. For uh, radionuclide imaging, they are based on administered activity. Now, quality assurance can be uh, concerned with both equipment as well as procedure. 
according to IRR, uh, the quality assurance of equipments come, come under IRR and the quality assurance of, of daily procedures comes under the IRMER. Uh, according to IRMER, the employer is required to have a medical physics expert appointed. Uh, according to the IRMER, uh, it is the duty of the invent uh, of the employer that an inventory should be kept of all the radiological equipments. According to the IRMER, uh, notification is required if the patient dose is much greater than intended, but which is not due to an equipment problem. For example, if a wrong patient is getting irradiated, uh, and uh, the enforcing authority for IRMER is Care Quality Commission. Now some practical applications of radiation protection. Uh, the room should be properly designed. Uh, the LED screen, the screen that protects the operator from the radiation source should have a 2 mm red of LED. The walls of the room should have 1 to 2 mm of LED. Maximum scatter at 1 meter distance from the patient uh, can be a maximum of 5 microgray per gray centimeter square. So this means that uh, for a patient dose of 2500 centigray centimeter square uh, this means that this is the area of the patient irradiated multiplied by the uh, dose that is applied so suppose that is 2500 then an operator standing at 1 meter distance should get a maximum of only 125 microgray of scatter radiation uh, another uh, practical application is to uh, is to place the x-ray tube below the patient so i say the main aim is all the scatter radiation that will be coming from the patient uh, would be more towards the foot of the operator and by that way the, the idea is to reduce irradiation of uh, more sensitive organs radio sensitive organs now uh, the lead apron for general work 0.35 mm of lead is recommended for uh, interventional work 0.5 uh, lightweight aprons uh, can have instead of lead they might have barium and tin and uh, for uh, thyroid for thyroid collars 0.5 mm of lead is uh, suggested for high dose procedures patient doses are uh, classified into high dose medium dose or low dose a high dose would be any investigation which gives a a dosage of 2 millisievert or more to the patient medium dose would be 0 0.02 millisievert to 2 millisievert and low dose will be less than 0 0.02 millisievert uh, next is about uh, personal dosimetry uh, this is a very important topic uh, there are different types of dosimetry uh, equipment that can be used the first one is film dosimetry so uh, in this one sensitivity is highly energy dependent the sensitivity is uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 millisievert the disadvantage is that uh, disadvantages are it cannot be used to assess uh, finger dose it is subject to environmental effects uh, and some features include the film has two different emulsions on each side so the films can detect uh, beta radiation as well as radioactive splash uh, it usually has two filters the aluminium filter will stop beta particles and the cadmium filter stops alpha particles uh, another disadvantage is that it is unsuitable for usage of more than one month the next one is uh, TLD badges they have minimal energy dependence the thing is that their sensitivity is uh, almost very similar to film dosimetry systems they are less susceptible to environmental effects but the thing is very at very high temperatures uh, all their data from the TLD can get uh, deleted uh, it it can be used to assess finger dose and it is most commonly used to assess finger dose uh, it can be reused but the thing is they can be read only once uh, they also require filters uh, they are expensive but can be reused uh, next two are more advanced dosimeters 
uh, optically stimulated luminescent dosimeter their uh, the main uh, component is aluminum oxide they are uh, laser red uh, sensitivity is uh, higher it is about 0 0.01 millisievert and it allows for further readings electronic dosimeters they are based on Giger Muller tube these are uh, gas filled tubes uh, they can also be based on silicon dioxide detectors they have a very high energy dependence they require filters sensitivity is uh, very high uh, to the level of 1 micro sievert direct reading is possible the disadvantage is that they are expensive and the most commonly used uh, dosimetry system is TLD badges uh, and the main component is uh, lithium fluoride this is because it has an effective atomic number of 8.2 which is very similar to our tissues the discs are usually uh, 4 millimeter wide and uh, 1 millimeter thick so that uh, it is not usually visible on a radiograph now some methods of dose assessment the first one is uh, ESG which is entrance surface dose entrance surface dose can be directly measured using a TLD dosimeter another method is to calculate the ESG using KV, MAS and the backscatter ratio uh, the disadvantage is that ESG cannot be applied to multiple projections another method of dose assessment is a dose area product this is especially applicable in uh, fluoroscopy units so uh, most fluoroscopy equipment is fitted with DAP meters now for the operator the scatter radiation which he is getting is proportional to the uh, dose area product and scatter is more uh, towards the entrance side of the patient for the patient uh, doubling in dose area product means a double of uh, means a doubling of the risk due to the radiation now one point is that it is possible to convert a dose area product or ent entrance surface dose into effective dose with conversion factors now there was a question in some book about whether absorbed dose can be converted into effective dose and in that one the answer was given as uh, false uh, and uh, this conversion factors which we just discussed depend mainly on the region of the body and also on the projection and it also uh, it also depends on but to a lesser extent on kv and beam filtration so just some practical points the conversion factors for skull and shoulder will be less uh, for pa it will be less than ap view and uh, variations throughout the trunk is uh, small because most of the organs radio sensitive organs are uh, placed more or less uniformly distributed in the trunks now one thing is that uh, even though doubling in dose area product doubles the risk uh, DAP is not directly related to the radiation risk it has to be first uh, converted uh, into effective dose and then uh, we can relate it to the uh, radiation risk now some uh, other regulations which are uh, uh, which are related to radiation protection uh, the radioactive substances act 1993 is concerned with uh, population as a whole and the environment uh, according to it uh, the use of radioactive substance must be authorized uh, to hold as well as dispose the radioactive substance the medicines administration of radioactive substances uh, mars 1978 regulation it is uh, concerned with patient protection so this one is mainly concerned with uh, radionuclide investigations according to it people who are handling radioactive sources much must require certificates which are granted by the RSAC which is the administration of radioactive substances advisory committee and uh, the licenses are specific to the hospital so that means a person might be granted a certificate to work in a particular hospital he cannot use that certificate to go to some other hospital and work and uh, RSAC issues guidance on approved tests and uh, normal and maximum levels of radioactivity to be used the maximum levels are generally considered to be the national DRL for these procedures so the DRL in the case of uh, radioactive 
substances issued by the uh, RSAC and RSAC certificates are valid for five years. Uh, next one is uh, Environment Permitting Regulations 2010. It is concerned with the uh, protection of the environment and uh, the enforcing body is the Environment Agency of England and Wales. Now uh, some absorbed doses in radiology. Uh, these are usually not asked but um, if, if you have time just uh, try to remember. For PHS uh, it's uh, 0.15. For uh, AP abdomen x-ray is 5 milligray. For uh, lateral lumbar spine, it is very high, almost uh, 12 milligray. For uh, fluoroscopy, skin dose rates are uh, almost about 5 to 50 milligray per minute. For uh, CT scan, uh, it can be anywhere from 10 to 30 milligray, depending upon the region. Uh, the fetal dose, in case of a pregnant patient, uh, if you are taking an AP pelvis, then the fetal dose will be 1.5 milligray. For barium minima, it can be 5 milligray. For uh, CT pelvis, it can be uh, up to 30 milligray. Now, some points about radiation protection. Uh, X-ray rooms can use uh, X-ray room walls uh, can have one to two millimeter of lead. And generally, two millimeter of lead is used. Instead of lead, what can be used is uh, bricks. Bricks can also be used for protection. And the thing is, uh, one twenty millimeter thick brick will give uh, a protection of one millimeter of lead. So, if you want to get the same protection as two millimeter of lead, uh, you need to use twenty four centimeter width of bricks. And another alternative is uh, to use two centimeter of barium plaster. Two centimeter of barium plaster also gives the same protection as 2 mm of lead. Now lead screens uh, typically have a 2 mm width of lead. Lead aprons can have a different width of lead. They can have 0 0.25, 0 0.35 or 0 0.5 mm. Uh, now the thing is that 0.25 mm of lead transmits 5% of the radiation. 0 0.35 transmits 3% and 0.5 transmits only 1.5% of radiation. Lead aprons, uh, what is typically used is 0.35 for general uh, work and 0.5 for interventional procedures. Thyroid collars usually have 0.5 mm width of lead. Now, uh, lightweight uh, lead aprons, uh, I'm sorry, not lead aprons, lightweight aprons utilize barium and tin instead of lead. Now coming to source of uh, radiation exposure to the stuff, the first one is uh, primary radiation. So uh, suppose you have an x-ray tube here and uh, the patient is here. So primary radiation means the radiation that is coming from the x-ray tube to the patient. So usually people are, the staff are not exposed to this radiation because uh, the x-ray tube is directly pointed at the patient and uh, there is no one standing in between. But uh, in case of interventional radiology work, what happens is sometimes the fingers of the operator might come in between. So what should be done is uh, gloves should be worn for uh, protection. And one practical point is under couch tubes help reduce exposure to the stuff. This is because even if scatter radiation is there, it will be pointed at the foot of the stuff, uh, avoiding all of the uh, radio sensitive organs. Now the next radiation source is uh, transmitted radiation. So transmitted radiation is the radiation that is uh, passing through the patient and then coming to the other side. So the staff are also not so much affected by uh, transmitted radiation because uh, uh, usually people, all the staff will be uh, in front of the patient and uh, usually there is nobody uh, at the back of the patient. And uh, the next one is uh, leakage radiation. Leakage means the uh, radiation that is leaking from the X-ray tube and uh, coming at the stuff. So it should be a maximum one milligray at a distance of one meter. And the next one is uh, scatter radiation. Uh, scatter radiation arises from mostly from Compton interactions in the patient as well as the collimator. 
so how scatter radiation comes is uh, primary radiation hits the patient and uh, some of the uh, radiation gets scattered and then it comes back at the stuff so this is the main source of radiation to the stuff so uh, all the lead aprons most of the work what they are doing is they are protecting the stuff against this scatter radiation because this is the most uh, prominent source of uh, radiation now some methods of radiation protection of the patient first one is collimation because uh, any area that is not of interest uh, does not need to be irradiated and so the beam should be collimated to the field of interest during uh, fluoroscopy magnified fields of views may reduce those uh, because uh, usually what happens is as the as the field of view gets magnified uh, the brightness decreases so there has to be an increased uh, dose to compensate for that uh, to compensate for that decrease in brightness but practically what is seen is uh, even though a little bit of dose is increased the actual or the eventual advantage is that you have a slight uh, reduction in the dose when you are actually magnifying the field uh, another one is uh, supplementary shielding this is especially for the gonads uh, like if you are taking an x-ray of the pelvis you can protect the gonads as long as they are not obstructing the uh, field of view or the region of interest uh, during fluoroscopy the image intensifier should be kept as close as possible to the patient uh, another another method to decrease patient dose is uh, removal of an anti scatter grid but the problem is the contrast will decrease because uh, there will be an increase in scatter radiation uh, increased filtration also uh, reduces the patient dose this is because most of the radiation that is uh, when you are applying a filter most of the radiation will be higher energy radiation so this radiation actually promote this this is the radiation that which we want like the high energy radiation crosses the patient and comes till the detector uh, if you are not filtering what happens is the beam contains a, a lot of low energy uh, low energy rays which are eventually getting absorbed by the patient these low energy beams are not contributing to the image what happens is they just hit the patient and they get attenuated so they are not helping in forming the uh, in not helping in forming the image so the for an ideal ideal image what we want is a greater proportion of high energy x-rays and that is what filtration does now uh, in case of radionuclide scan the best uh, breastfeeding is to be stopped for uh, 24 hours following the scan now we'll be looking at some values uh, values are not very important but if you have time then definitely uh, just take a look at them now this one was discussed earlier patient effective doses high doses greater than 2 millisievert medium is between 0 0.02 and 2 millisievert low dose is 0, less than 0 0.02 millisievert and uh, examination doses uh, for high dose investigations include those greater than 2 millisievert so these include CT abdomen, chest, barium, bone scans, IV urography, CT head medium dose includes barium solo, technician perfusion, lung perfusion scan, lumbar spine x-ray, pelvis AP x-ray low dose includes uh, chest x-ray, dental x-rays and finally a small note about the pregnant staff operating x-rays uh, it is uh, her duty that uh, she has to inform her employer in writing that uh, she is pregnant and uh, she can continue working in the same place and doesn't have to alter her working practice uh, that is because uh, the actual exposure to uh, radiology staff is very less uh, and so less that it is even less than the uh, normal limits for uh, general public so the thing is in a practical aspect there is no need for the pregnant staff to change her working place because uh, the risk of radiation is very minimal especially in present times.
so this is all about uh, uh, radiation protection uh, this is a very important chapter and uh, uh, a lot of questions do come from this one and uh, the topics are very volatile like you have to keep reading them and uh, you will uh, otherwise you would forget it very easily uh, especially because the regulations and all those stuff uh, we are not following them every day and we are not used to reading these things uh, it's not like daily reporting what we do like all the anatomy and all is something that we see every day but uh, things like this regulation all these things these are like we only read them uh, mostly for the exam and stuff so uh, just uh, try to revise especially on the day before the exam you know, it will be really helpful the notes will be in the link in the description uh, it might be easier to revise from the notes uh, instead of rewatching the video um, uh, hope the video helped you all thank you